We're going to start. All right, thanks everybody for sticking around. Uh, we are going to present on predictable continuous deployment. And we're going to talk about all the painful lessons that we've learned along our journey towards a predictable continuous deployment uh, with Drupal and how to uh, hopefully inspire you to make your environments and your deployments rock. So uh, the presentation is divided into essentially three sections. Uh, lessons in doing things the wrong way. Uh, components of good predictable deployment. So we're going to share some of the things that we started uh, doing wrong many, many years ago. And hopefully it will be a group hug and you guys will be kind with us and remember some of the pain points that you've gone through. Uh, some of the ways in we've attempted and are continuing to attempt to make that process better for everybody involved. And uh, of course, how we do it with Drupal. So what this presentation is not about, and if you came here just for this, I will not be offended if you decide to spend your time uh, elsewhere, but of course I hope that you stay. But we're definitely not going to talk about tools. There's a lot of tools discussion. There have been a lot of tools discussion. Uh, discussions here, so we are not going to specifically provide uh, tools, code examples, definitely no live demos. As you have seen in our 10 minute slide presentation setup, we're not going to try to attempt uh, that right now. And uh, we are not going to be very specific about prescribing uh, the frameworks and how you do that. There are many, many ways of doing that. Uh, obviously, there are sponsors here that have created an opinionated way of making this easier. Uh, we're not going to provide an opinionated way of doing it. We're just going to talk about the processes that we've had to go on through uh, and a w an approach that we take to make that happen. All right, so about us. Uh, I am Andy Kuharski. I am the president and founder of Promet Source, uh, and I make it really easy for you to follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's A Kuharski. I know you guys all know how to spell that, so um, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll, I'll put it up at the end of the presentation. I'm Johnny Fox. I'm the CTO of Promet. I've been with Promet for six years. I lead the team that has suffered with, struggled, and developed our continuous integration process. Yeah, we're not shy about sharing our pain, huh? Uh, so a little bit about us. Uh, we are a full stack uh, and full service development, uh, Drupal development shop in Chicago. We're pretty distributed. Uh, we also offer services around uh, training. So we have a training uh, uh, practice and um, as well as accessibility uh, testing. The one thing that we started doing very early on, and we've been working with Drupal since 2008, so we still have a S Drupal 5 site running in production uh, somewhere out there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Somebody, somebody's impressed with that. Uh, we have taken on support of Drupal websites that we did not build from the very beginning. Uh, so we have seen things. We have seen a lot of things. Uh, we have taken on uh, sites that we did not build. We take on sites that are in any environment, uh, any hosting environment, uh, internal hosting environments. Uh, so we have learned and we had to adapt to that uh, reality. That is something that we have chosen to do strategically. And as a result, we have seen a lot of different and we had to adapt to a lot of different ways uh, that w or a lot of different ways in which Drupal sites were built and we had to adapt to our clients' needs. All right, so who are you? We want to know about you. Um, which Lego, which of these Lego uh, uh, characters represents you? Please raise your hand if you are a developer. Ooh, that's a majority in here. All right. Uh, please raise your hand if you are a systems engineer or ops person. Okay, that's that's pretty decent. That's pretty and and uh, <clears throat> sorry about this uh, characterization. If you're a product owner, a project manager, a business owner, <laughs> please raise your hand. <laughs> All right, I, I will raise my hand. I, yes, that's uh, <laughs> that's me as well. Well, thank you. I had to throw in some logo uh, pieces and a slide. Right, that's um, that's necessary. 
Uh, so uh, why should you care about CI and CD? Uh, obviously, you're in here and uh, you care about it by, by attending these sessions. Uh, we're not going to define exactly what it is. Michelle Krejci's earlier presentation did a pretty good job of describing that and her journey into uh, uh, learning that. I highly recommend that. Um, development obviously cares about deploying, building code and deploying features quickly. Operations cares about maintaining current state and making sure that uptime is and uptime is uptime is maintained is maintained, that uh, sites uh, respond quickly and uh, not many changes uh, cause the beepers and the pagers. Ooh, I just said beepers. <coughs> I'm old. Uh, <laughs> pay your phone to vibrate. Pager pager duty. That's a that's a good pager, right? Uh, so if we had a magic wand, right, whether you're an ops or a product owner or project manager or a developer, uh, you could uh, walk up to your desk, say, Alexa, please deploy version dev v2.01.5 to my staging environment of this project. And it would just happen. I actually have seen this happen on a demo. <laughs> uh, it did work. It was a, it was a live demo. I'm pretty sure that was a live demo. Um, so uh, what? That, that's the magic wand, right? And uh, where did we start off? Where did we do things? I've I've been involved in deploying uh, software for about 20 years. Obviously, prior uh, to Drupal, we're deploying enterprise systems. Um, custom build uh, uh, applications and for about 15 years um, websites. So this is where you guys hopefully will see, have suffered, well, hopefully you can, I will, I will, sh I will display on uh, public offering our suffering that we have uh, experienced uh, deploying software manually, right? So do you uh, remember those days ever or has anybody had to um, move files around from one server to another? Uh, making sure that the, you got the right files and you didn't script it and then you forgot a file, you got a long version. <sighs> that was not fun, right? Running database scripts. Um, or um, have you ever run into uh, testing your code in an environment that you think is just like production? Johnny, do you remember that one time where we were running that that we, we followed all the right steps. We thought we had the uh, exact replica of the production. We asked the client for the Nginx ver version, for, or sorry, it was an Apache version. The, you know, the LAMP stack was exactly the same. The project had a tight deadline. We ran, we pushed it to production, big unveil, total fail. Like, wait a second, why? We, we, we tried to take these steps. We banged our heads against Hopefully, hopefully our presentation uh, display will not fail. We, we banged our heads against the wall for a while, only to find out that our client was running a uh, LAMP stack emulator on a mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> Did not provide us with a, t a testing environment. They said, don't worry, it's gonna be the same. No worries. Uh, so we've, we've got some scars from that. That's why we're very passionate about making sure that it's uh, the target, your testing environment is the same as the test environment. Um, and more, uh, uh, <clears throat> has anybody ever had to receive a, uh, a push script that's uh, in an email that instructs you this manual clicks that you have to take? Okay, I know you guys, you guys are way above that, so hopefully um, uh, we, we'll share our pain. That, that has happened to us before, so we really try to make sure that we, we don't do that. So what are the, the principles around uh, what we're, we've been doing and, and how we try to make our team's lives uh, easier, better, and funner? That's not a word, by the way, more fun. Um, so we want to be able to make sure that the package itself is tested. The package of release is tested, so it's reliable, right? It's reliable and repeatable. Uh, there's no better uh, feeling from uh, project managers or product owners or uh, you know talking to a client that says we're going we 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 do a, a build from scratch every single day. I know that this software will build. I know that it will uh, run because it's that's predictable. That's that's reliable. 
Uh, we have a saying around uh, Promat that uh, says we love lazy developers. <clears throat> we do, and what we mean by that is uh, we love for everyone to automate stuff so you don't have to do the mind-numbing things over and over again. Uh, so automate uh, whatever you can, as, as, as often as, uh, as you can. Obviously, keep everything in version control. Uh, we'd also like to bring the pain forward. So if it's so something that is painful, let's, let's uh, make sure that we have a good retro about it. Let's talk about it. What are the challenges to doing the things that we need to do, whether it's an environment version or whether it's you know having a mainframe run, run on your local. How can we uh, get, get uh, past those things? Those need to be brought up and the risks need to be identified and we need to talk about how we're gonna get around that or what happens if something goes wrong. Uh, build quality in, so everybody's job is to build quality in. Uh, testing is obviously a big part of what we do, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, that um, and, uh, and, and continuous improvement, right? So make sure you listen to everyone and everybody when you do your uh, uh, retrospectives. It's a safe environment. Uh, it's a learning environment, and everybody should be... Uh, encouraged and understand they can speak freely without feeling like you're attacking somebody because that's where you really learn the lessons that need to apply to uh, the things that you're going to do to make things better. So uh, we have a number of resources that we uh, looked at and we pay attention to. Um, I also want to emphasize that DevOps is a, is a big cultural thing, and it makes things better in your culture, right? When, there's, when releases go out without stress, and when you follow uh, and you buy into the, to the process, uh, things culturally, culturally are better. This is uh, from a um, study that was, uh, uh, I think, released last year. It talks about organizations who adapt uh, DevOps practices. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, great results, uh, I mean, unbelievable results, 200 times more code releases for high-performing high organizations. Uh, this is a tongue twister for me, the other point uh, from the product and uh, uh, project managers. Uh, teams that adopt high-performing uh, high DevOps cultures are twice as, twice as likely to recommend other people to work with your company. So. It's worth uh, buying into that, and, and if you need to convince somebody that we need to spend more time on building your test, your automated testing, or better uh, push process, uh, feel free to uh, find that study. Uh, it just this talks a little bit about what um, high uh, IT performers are. So the, being able to deploy uh, frequency, uh, being able to deploy frequently, that also has to do with making sure to deploy. D don't try to do the big monolithic deploys. Uh, limit. Uh, what you're deploying so you can, it can be testable. Um, failure rates are better, mean time to uh, resolve, and, and, and so on. All right, so we're going to now talk about predictable CI Promet. All right, thanks, Andy. Uh, first, I want to apologize for the title predictable deployment because you can still have predictable deployment without continuous in integration. I can predict you're going to fail epically. You're going to have some days when your server is just a smoldering crater of why is this not working? You know, the classic, it worked on my, my local, why is it not here? Uh, that's predictable. What we're really talking about is how do we get a predictable, successful deployment? And that, that is a, um, that's a struggle. There's some kind of basic tenets, and what I, my goal here today is to pass on what we adopt as those tenets, give you a little bit of history. One of those is that you have a formal workflow process that we use the local development, dev, staging, production workflow. There are a couple workflows where we have where we actually introduce another step of a, of a client QA environment. I know that. Uh, there's a couple of the uh, platforms as a service that offer that to be able to see individual releases. Where we started was, as Andy mentioned, 2008. We saw the need that as we were deploying that we needed to have repeatable environments and we needed to have a way that those environments were the same. So in 2010, we were one of the first people to come out with Chef, which is Chef is a server configuration management tool can also be used to configure 
applications, uh, but this was very early when we were starting. When we start, uh, what I wanted to show is a little bit is that as you're on your continuous integration, continuous deployment journey, don't be afraid to get started. Like start small and, and build on it. I know we have a lot of developers, so a dancing analogy doesn't work, but you know, you, you learn one step and then you learn the next step and you, you build on that. So as we worked over time, we, we kept adding a piece. So very much kind of an, an agile, you say, well, you know, features and chef, and now we need some build scripts, and now we need GetFlow. And uh, in here you can see we changed configuration management. We went to Ansible. We've used different places along. So what, what I really want you to take away is start somewhere, start today, and add pieces onto it. In, in our environment, you, you need to be learning as, as you're working. From the continuous uh, delivery book that Andy showed, we've adopted some CI principles. There's some of these that I think are, all of these are important and all of these are goals of what you should have. You can't have continuous integration without revision control. I can't imagine anyone doing development that way. You want to automate the things. Uh, we've already talked about testing in a clone of production, and really testing in a clone of production is all the way up and down the stack. You want to replicate that environment as much as you can. Frequent commits, um, putting all the code together. Our team is spread out across. Uh, we also have a, an office in the Philippines. We have a development team there. We work with people all over the U.S. We're spread out. There may be multiple people working on a project and just having one person's code sitting there not knowing whether or not it builds is a real issue for us. So we use uh, HipChat as our platform for communication across the company. And that addresses uh, co code consolidations, build availability, and test availability. What I'm showing here is inside of our HipChat, we're actually able to see, and for each project there is a room that's there, so our commits from GitHub when the project is being built, if that succeed, fails, succeeds, we're able to see that immediately. We're able to see the results of the tests. Uh, those links are all piped into there, and that happens throughout the day. So if you're a project manager, you, can, you don't have to go call all the developers and say like, okay, is that, is that okay on your you're local, okay, call the next person, say you're working on this other feature, is that okay? You can see the status of it in real time. As a developer or as a um, solutions architect, you're able to see what's happening as well. So some of you may be thinking, well, you know, I, I've, you may have a uh, fairy tale life, you may have been very good in the, the prior life and you're very blessed and you have really the same environment you deploy to all the time that you're deploying to Acquia or to Pantheon or you work at um, a place where you have, we're all on CentOS, we know what version of PHP we're on, we don't have to work like that. If you did something very bad in your prior life, you may wind up at an agency that supports many websites. Promet supports hundreds of websites I want to share with you a little bit of the complexity that we run into. So we wind up with a few operating systems to support. And the, you know, the great thing about operating systems is not only it's not just Linux, it's which flavor of Linux. Is it Debian or Red Hat? Is it SUSE? Uh, Oracle Linux, for anyone that's not worked with it, is different, even though it's on Red Hat. We also support client sites under Windows Server. And uh, then you get on a layer of, well, which database are you working? You know, how do you optimize that database? If we want to be a little bit more complex, then we wind up with the hosting platforms. Uh, could be Google Cloud, could be Azure, could be Acquia or Pantheon. And uh, all of these are, are great platforms. Uh, I, I dream of a day when we, we all deploy and, and that there's not variability between that. One of the things we see is that for each one of these platforms, there's a set of different hooks. So spinning up a server on Rackspace is different than Linode. That metaphor doesn't apply to platform. 
but we still need to develop our Drupal so that we can, we can deploy there. You have the additional complexity of, um, you know, Terminus is not the same as what you do on Acquia. Some of the platforms have uh, modules that are specific that need to be ran to manage varnish on their environment that's, that's different. Uh, this, this is a really kind of wicked problem. So to make it more fun, then you can layer on what services are you connected to. Uh, we've had really a lot of fun with Shibboleth. It has to have a daemon that runs in Linux to connect to. So, uh, and if you're not testing this, if you're not looking at that, uh, you can just expect the client's gonna call and say, why can't I log into the server? What was, what was that change? Um, same thing with Varnish. Maybe you're working on a platform, a client controls it. Uh, there's a Varnish upgrade from 2.2 to 2.4. I'll just share with you the, the VCL files are different on those. Like you have to be, you have to be testing. So it's, it's a really complex problem for every different client. So remember, like a couple hundred projects to support. And all of these involve different sets of combinations of these. So maybe one CentOS, PHP 5.6, uh, some clients are still on 5.2. I know it's crazy, but you may be in a large enterprise environment. There's security concerns. There, um, that's just the way they run. They're going to be on 5.2. Nobody can change it, and that's what you have to deal with. So, to address this on our side, we started out with we realized that well, you know, we just need it's just a Drupal, right? Drupal's just it's just PHP, and I need MySQL, and I need a web server. So MAMP, XAMPP, one of those solutions, like that'll work. Pretty soon we got into, well, but you're working multiple projects, so you need to be able to have something that's portable that replicates that environment. So we, virtualization came along, we went to VirtualBox, just almost immediately, um, pulled Vagrant on top of that so that we had a little bit more control of the configuration of boxes, went through a, um, went through a round of what, what is quick in Vagrant. So uh, with Vagrant and Drupal VM, one of the challenges that we have is we have an office overseas, we have people that work remote on places that have slow connections, anything where you're loading the entire box and the whole stack and that has to be built each time you build the environment that can add a lot of overhead if you're in the US and you have gigabit internet you're set if you have a 10 megabit connection and you're in Asia and you've got to pull something down you're talking about something in the US that could happen maybe in 15 minutes takes you four hours so uh, today what we're using is docker we found that more portable it's quicker for us to use um, and you know we'll see we'll see what comes next with uh, containerization. Second part you really have to have is a CI server. There's a number of these. They're all I think they're all good choices. I have trouble. We made a choice internally because of our what our skills are. Uh, we have a dedicated DevOps team. As you've seen, we have kind of this complex topography of things that we deploy to, so we need really granular control over that. And we have settled on Jenkins. We could have an argument about which one's better. I say, you know, pick one that fits your, your organization. Testing. Why, why do I have testing here? So, uh, Continuous integration without any testing is just automating your failures. It does you no good to build the server and know to build your application and not know if it succeeds. And uh, I'm sure no one here has had when you build the Drupal and you know I've changed something on a few pages, I need to make a few menu tweaks, I've moved a block around, and then I look at that, we test that, we deploy it and there's some other page somewhere that is totally broken from the result of those changes. Anyone have that? Yeah, I mean, you're in Drupal, all of you need to raise your hand. Like, I'm, I'm not believing, 
that you really have to have testing, and that is the fantastic uh, piece of this because clicking through hundreds of Drupal pages is a waste of human life. It's terrible. Humans are terrible at it. Um, even on the best days, it's slow, it's expensive, it doesn't add value to your project. It doesn't add as much value as automated testing. There is a place for it. So we use a combination of testing, and as I was mentioning, like on this evolution, we keep adding steps. So we're, you, we started several years ago using the HAT framework for testing. We're also using the robot framework for testing now. Those are uh, behavioral testing, so I'm able to click on different pages, go to those. Uh, visual regression is something that we've, we've added, and those tests need to be available. Like, I need to know before it's Wednesday and I have a push for the client on Thursday if the build is succeeding or not. We're working on a couple week sprints. As a project manager, as a, a developer, like it really doesn't help me to go two weeks, think everything's great and not, so you need to have those tests really quickly available. Um, Bahat is, um, let me just go through this. Uh, there's a Drupal library. It comes with many of your already uh, constructed tests for logins, basic Drupal navigation are already built there. There's a working group in Bahat that's actively maintained. People are passionate about it. Uh, it's one of the reasons we developed it for projects that we are developing new. Uh, Bahat is kind of our tool of choice for building and behavioral testing. Bahat is, the language is Gherkin, so you can see just at the top, it says, you know, this is a feature. In order to do this, as a user, I need to do this thing. You put your assertions in there. It's a plain English language. You have very, um, you know, it's, this is easy to read. This is available from inside of your Jenkins console and it just reads that out. You can see every time that this test is run, you can see that this, this happens, and even if you're not working on this piece of the project and it breaks, you're gonna get a failure and you're gonna know about it. Sure. Uh, often when we talk about uh, investing in automated testing and writing the test scripts and writing test cases when we build projects, we sometimes get questions about whether it's worth it. Is it worth on my project? Is it worth to invest that time up front? Uh, to do that, and uh, looking back on what we've done, unless you're going to build it once in one day and then never touch the site again, ever, the answer is yes, it's worth it. Good, good point. Uh, this is the Jenkins dashboard. If you're using Travis or Circle, it's going to be different, but you're going to have some of these elements. You're gonna have the, the console output, you're gonna be able to see you know, your source control is tied into this. Your source control gives you the commit. We can see what's, what's there. And in this case, we're building a single, a single commit is building. So you're very granular. Really important that you're doing the, these builds frequently and that they are granular. If you wait two weeks to see if everything builds, you're gonna be going back through doing a bunch of cherry picking and like removing modules to see where, where did it fail at? If you have that build test early, then you're able to spot that. So test availability, we actually build, um, Bahat will generate uh, an HTML output of how did your test run that actually gives you a report. We link that into our hip chat room and that gives you the ability just to immediately see that the test ran, click on it, see where, where did that happen. Uh, I'm showing failures because failures are really your important, that's what you're wanting to catch. You know, I know as developers, we all want to lay down perfect code. It just doesn't happen that way. So what we need to know is we need to have that feedback and we need to have it off often. Uh, this is part of that same Bahat report that we saw earlier, but this gives the individual scenarios. It tells you, you know, how many of them passed, how many failed, how long it takes to run. Uh, it's, um, it's great. So there's another piece of this. So talking about layers of testing is we also have a code sniffer connected to the project and that checks for Drupal coding standards. 
code that is written well, code that is easy to read, has less bugs. Uh, if you've read um, Code Complete or Rapid Development, any of those books, and you've worked, like it's just easier to debug code that's written well. So automatically, it will come through, it will check your project for just layout. And having worked with um, a lot of projects that come in, we see different kinds of coding, we see stuff that's just ran together, it's hard to spot. Having some way to know what, what state that code in is good and it keeps us all honest as developers when you're committing that you go like, oh, I failed, I failed there. Um, we also, so Andy also talked about, we have projects we didn't write. Those projects don't come over with the hat test. We may not be familiar with that. Uh, so we have our, we have a dedicated QA team. That QA team uses robot framework. It's a uh, project that's available. Uh, there's a blog on our site about how to use it, how to install it. It has a, a graphical interface. You can go in on the front and build tests, so it's very suited for a QA team to run and go through and do a behavioral test to run on the project. On projects that we're supporting, if we do uh, additional work, we'll build those in this, this test. Uh, suite. It gives us a way to give code coverage on those. It's not necessarily dependent on on us having done the development, but gives us a way to check those. It's just an additional layer. So we also have manual code review. I think this is a, an additional testing piece that's really important. Is not only have I written the test for it, you know, but someone else looks at it. You know, did you understand what what it's supposed to do. Hopefully you've written the test beforehand and that test has been, uh, been written and, and looked at. For our entire company, we use GitHub. We use GitHub for all projects. So if you're on Bitbucket and we have to work with you, we get to work with you. <laughs> we get to work with you. We're going to develop in GitHub and we're going to do a commit to Bitbucket because the way our process works is everyone's projects, everyone's code, anyone can go look at anyone else's code. It's expected, uh, demanded, encouraged that you look at other people's projects. One of the very early projects I led, we had an issue where kind of, you know, in a, in a group there was some coding issues and just because there wasn't you know, kind of eyes from the outside, it's real easy to be inside of a project and not see what you need, so we, we added this code review piece manually and that's shared with the entire company where people can see what's going on there. If I clicked into these, I would also see comments inside of GitHub that the developers are making. Uh, this will give me, uh, as, a, as a project manager or an account manager, it gives me the ability to, to see what's going on there. The next layer we've added is we're using a tool that we've written internally using uh, WebKit and PhantomJS. Those are really great tools. So especially for sites that are very large or complex, as I mentioned, humans are not great about, like, it's just terrible to have a list of 100, 200 URLs. You've got to click through them on production and you've got to click through on staging and see you know, did anything change there? So what this tool allows us to do is allows us to feed us feed the site map XML from your Drupal site in, select the pages we're gonna test, it will test it before and after, so it uses a reference copy, and what it does is it just literally does a full page screen capture and then does a diff of that page and highlights it. So the kind of things you're gonna pick up are you know, you're going to pick up blocks out of place, you're going to pick out color differences, you're going to pick out um, when the Twitter, Twitter feed updates. Uh, it also has parameters where we can test for different viewport layouts. So we're not uh, emulating mobile, but we are able to pick the mobile viewports for tablet and for mobile and test all those and that's done automated. Uh, it's been a great time saver on our QA team. It's actually created a lot of uh, open time for that team to take on some new initiatives. But just 
you know, and it delivers more value for the clients and you can get that report, you know, you know how the site looks when you're, um, when you're completed without having to wait for, for it. You have to wait for it a little bit, but. So next steps, uh, we are working on some internal initiatives for accessibility testing. Is that offering, is automating it? If you've worked with accessibility testing, you know that automated tools do not catch everything. However, uh, what we're looking to do is something very similar to the visual regression test that we can run a tool, get a report afterwards, and see where the project is. So that's, that's the next one. We're Additionally, uh, monitoring. So why is monitoring good? I know that none of you have ever had a push where you introduced something that ate up more CPU cycles or maybe had a loop in the background. So as a standard uh, faucet of what we're doing is we install monitoring on all of our dev servers so that we can see we set that up. We'll put warnings in there in New Relic. Even the free version of New Relic will allow you to uh, set alarms for CPU usage, database usage, uh, and let you know when it's over a certain threshold. And that's, that's helped us catch um, a lot of issues. Deploying artifacts. So I'm borrowing also from uh, Michelle Krejci's. Uh, I see that um, Acquia has also adopted this in some of their new pipelines, and that is deploying artifacts. So with all of those different server environments that we're deploying to, what we found is that if we try to deploy into those environments and we're deploying all the tools, you're deploying Bahat, you're deploying Composer, you're deploying Gulp, you're deploying SAS. That's a whole stack of dependencies on the server that you really don't have to have and it limits where you can go. Sometimes you don't even have the ability to go into the client server and, and see those things. So we're working with, uh, if we're, we're working with Bitbucket or we're working with Acquia or Pantheon, we're connecting to their get, it allows us just to deploy only the Drupal. Then I only need the Drupal things to just deploy. I need my, uh, I need all of my updates to be in code. So I need to be using configuration management or features if you're in Drupal 7. And we just deploy the Drupal. Uh, it's uh, a little bit of uh, learning to get that. And it does divorce some of the, the code history. But we found this to be a way to allow us to work over that multitude of environments and just deploy only the Drupal. I've uh, compiled a list of resources that we use internally. These are all very good. Uh, it will take you a while to read through these. Don't think that you need to go use all of the resources. Uh, today, what I recommend is you know, commit to doing CI, get started with it, start small, and then learn those, those next steps. Um, all of these books have been referenced, so those are things that we use. And then, uh, Andy, I'm going to let you uh, Just wrap up. Wrap up here. Uh, so last week, when we were heading uh, out to DrupalCon and we are kind of polishing our presentation, I stopped by Melissa's desk. This is Melissa. You can see she's not miserable like we talked about a previous experience. She's happy. I said, Melissa, why are you so happy? She said, I had five different deployments this week, every single day different clients, different environments. Everything went well. Everything was great. So it can happen. Uh, if uh, uh, I encourage you to follow some of those practices. Um, we are asked to uh, uh, display uh, the Friday sprints. And please evaluate us. As I mentioned, we, uh, we are trying to make it easy for you to follow us on Twitter. Uh, I've also posted these slides at the uh, bottom of the, of the session. Uh, description and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions? I have one. Yep. Um, so sometimes, and you mentioned this at the start, that you have these kind of like less than ideal scenarios. 
Um, one of the problems, I work for an agency, and one of the problems that we have is um, some of our production servers for some of our clients are behind VPNs. And the current situation is we end up having to manually deploy code. Um, and some of these VPNs are kind of like you have to, you know, authenticate with, you know, Google authentication and things like that. Wondering whether you have any experience or potential solutions for things like that. So the question is, I have production servers which are behind VPNs, and how do you deploy where you have very little access to those environments? Did I get that right? Yes. Johnny? Yeah, we have that, that exact experience. Uh, I think um, the, we have to go through a Cisco client for one of our clients employed through the VPN. And here we adopt a strategy of just the best we can. We replicate their entire environment, do a deployment there ahead of time. Then through the VPN, we have a set of scripts on the other side that run to deploy so that we can automate the deployment on the other side as much as we can. But because of the way the authentication is built, there's no way to connect our CI server so that it can reach into their network and do the things that we need to do. It's a wicked problem. I wish there was a better solution. If you have it, I'd love to talk to you, but it's, it's uh, you know, I, I have had to do deployments before where I, I cannot touch the other environment at all, and we had to have a go to meeting share and have the client run the deployment from the other side. It's horrible. Hey, so uh, you you discussed um, a lot of the the tools that go into doing continuous development, uh, continuous deployments. Uh, you know, anything from local uh, to the server and actual actually hosting. Can you give a quick kind of rundown of what a kind of typical, you know, from feature to actually needs to get deployed, like kind of a quick you know rundown of what that process actually looks like. So the question is, I think, is what is what is the workflow from I've created a feature and to right. it's a task that needs to get to production on a Monday. So ticket up the feature in Jira. The developer does the work, writes the test that goes with that work, mm -hmm. commits that to a development branch. Our development servers are built every time there is a commit. So those are, those are being built continuously so that we can see what's going on. Most of our projects are built, and you know, one of the things I'm looking for is clients that are going to be, we're going to be able to work with and deploy continuously in production. We don't have that yet. That takes a certain level of, of maturity. So what we will do, we will tag a release, and when a release is tagged, our staging server will see that there is a tag, go out and build that onto the staging so that we have, it'll pull the production database into staging, build there, and that's when we can run regression on it. And then the production process is uh, a manual piece from Jenkins is that we can deploy to production where we have access, but you have to manually select, give it the branch that you're going to deploy. Gotcha. Um, most people are pretty rightfully so, afraid of like when do we schedule and do yeah. production. Uh, usually there's some timing about how do we take backups, make sure that we're not going to uh, make a mess of things and time that um, when there's testing to available. Okay, yeah. thanks. Hmm? I have a question regarding the behead. Like uh, you, you shown the one slide where you were showing like how many test cases has been uh, executed, how many passed. Like, is there any way uh, through the, uh, we can basically get a feeling how much we are covering through the BHAD? For example, like we have our sites that might be having uh, maybe 15 or 50 pages. Okay, how much, and maybe 15 functionalities. So is, is there any way like we can say, okay, my BHAD is covering this many functionality or that many functionality, like just looking at them or j we are just relying on the tester to write the behead like because like here like somebody can write the five test cases also somebody can write the 50 test cases also right we're we're not using that i think there are some other folks that i've talked to have, that have used for code coverage we really look for 
these are typically sites that we're building, so we know what the use cases are when we're starting. Mm -hmm. So we cover all of those use cases, and then as we find places, but I don't have something to run and say, you know, you've covered 80% mm -hmm. of the code. Okay, I don't have and, and how do you manage the, uh, the configuration for the different environment? Like for dev, like we have uh, some different settings, for production we have different settings. Some are there in the database, some are there in the code. Like, how do you manage them? Like, because, like, like in my case, like we are really struggling. Some there, sometimes we have credential in the database. Sometimes it's there in the code, which gets exposed. We don't want to do that, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we should not copy the production configuration on the stage environment, something like so. So the the question is, how do you manage deploying code to different environments? And I, I think and this is around the question of. Maybe in development, I want to have Devel enabled, and I want to hook up to the authorized.net mm -hmm. test gateway. Mm -hmm. exactly. we, we use a environment variable to pass which which environment we're building for. Mm -hmm. That will look into a manifest and tell us the settings that need to be set for module configurations, and pass that as a as a separate script. And where are you managing like those config? Where are you storing like whether it's a part of your configuration file, setting.php file, or like you just keeping somewhere on the production so that nobody should be having access to it? Like for like well, it's, it never goes to production because we're using the two repository status. Mm -hmm. So in our in our actual build, we have the the Drupal is located uh, in a folder below the project, and above the project is all of the configuration files and tests that run. So okay. in our GitHub repository, all of those are st stored in code in a um, XML okay. file, and then we read it back in. Okay, uh, like it means like the part of your code, right, which is there in the GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and is it encrypted or is just? No. no well, know. if it is, Depends on what information it is. So we'll use a secret key store if it has to do with payment data. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, those are internal to Promet, so we only have access. You know, only okay. Promet and mm -hmm. um, employees have access to the repository. So we assume that that's a, a safe environment, and we also have. Um, we use Ansible for configuring our servers. Okay. So if we do have a change in personnel, or we need to move or add people from the team we can organization-wide make those changes on access. Okay, thank you. A quick one. Um, you said you spun out, you built your own visual regression, regression testing framework. Are there no kind of existing CI tools out there for visual regression testing that you feel work? There are some good tools out there. We used Apply tools. We've used uh, some of the others. We want to have uh, our vision for that tool is to have a dashboard where we can see the entire history of the project, and we wanted something that we could control at a, a lower level so that we could see what did it look like last month, what did it look like last week, what did it look like each build. And when we looked at that set of feature stacks, we didn't see anything that was currently existing. And uh, the, the script is actually pretty simple for what it does. It's, you know, it's, it's just using a web driver grabbing that screenshot and doing that. And it worked well for us. It doesn't select region. So it's like, say, sometimes you'll get a slideshow that will fail because it has a different image on it. But it's really great where you have the kind of topography we do where you have many, many projects. You may have a project you come in and you do one thing on just to see pass, fail, what, what happened. Are you going to open source that? Is that? Yes. Great. Yes. yes. If, yeah, I, I will share that or, or tweet that. I'll have Molly uh, tweet that. But yes, we, we built on someone else's work, and if I could have found the URL, I would have put it here. So thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>